ABCD. Um, and I'd like clarification on that. Um, and also I would like to add that, yes, you know, this bill is for private use and it means for an individual at home using cannabis. However, um, cannabis is being sold at schools by high school children themselves. So schools, you know, they, they bring in the sniffer dogs, um, you know, to check if there is any kind of uh, drugs on the property or not. Uh, and children are being arrested at the schools for that. So no one, not even the department, has mentioned that aspect. So whatever bill that is passed, what should happen in the schools? What should the school governing bodies do? Because the bill will be used is for private use. But if we're having children selling uh, cannabis at school, you know, they can say, well, it's for my private use, but it is, it is being brought on school property and schools do get, are able to bring sniffer dogs and the police and are able to do, you know, drug testing in the schools, in high schools. So what then, you know, nobody's mentioning that, that aspect. Um, so, you know, if you could perhaps have a comment on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nugat Drachams. Um, Comrade Tony, your response. Thank you very much, Jay, and thank you for all those questions. Let me start by the first one, and that is uh, the Honourable Swats. Clearly, our thoughts are that the further engagement on the detail must happen in the master plan. So there's two things that I suppose we confronted with. The Constitutional Court has given Parliament a deadline to effect the changes, and so there is a challenge about complying with that deadline. <laughs> But now that we're getting into the discussion about both the bill that's been tabled, but at the same time, the master plan is coming from government. It's thrown up a whole different conversation within the society chair about what we need to do with cannabis as a whole, whereas the Constitutional Court just focused on one area, and that is the private use on it. And that's what Parliament set out to respond to. But the public policy and the public ambition we can clearly see is now driving us to a point where we. So, so, so sorry, Comrade Tony, uh, Mr. Ms. Zephyr, can you mute yourself? Uh, you can proceed. Comrade Tony, you can proceed. Thank you, Chair. Because the issues are interrelated, we have to find a way now to deal with a comprehensive policy also. So there is a challenge that the legislator has to respond to. We have the constitutional court deadlines, we have the instruction to parliament from them, and then we have the desire from both government and society to deal with a comprehensive policy for cannabis. And that's the obligation that we've got to respond to. So Kusatu supports the constitutional court findings and welcomes that and appreciate that government's moving to give effect to that and hope that we finalize that as soon as possible, but not outside of the comprehensive policy, because the private use of it may have much more limited implications than the overall economic opportunity and prospects if we effectively and properly manage what it is that we do with cannabis as a society. So there is an urgent need for us to engage with that. We've certainly seen that there are ways in which the legislature can fast track legislation. We've seen it in the World Cup with some of the regulations and now with the disaster management regulation also. So it's about the political will. It's about reaching a consensus as a society and then about making sure that we use the most appropriate methods that's available for us to do that. So Honorable Swartz, while the matter was at NEDLAC, it was nearly inappropriately brought to NEDLAC because NEDLAC in that form where it was brought to is not the area that engages with the master plans. Master plans have a specific defined and determined process that it should follow and government in all of its manifestations should be aware of that. So we were surprised when it came to NEDLAC, but that's neither here nor there. We appreciate having been made aware of it, but the process of engagement on the master plan and on the legislation is elsewhere. And that's where we want to, where we want to finalize a chair. 
on the misuse of, of, of drugs, there's always that danger. And we've got to be mindful of that. And a big part of how we re re reflect our mindfulness is on education. We've got to do a lot more education around that to make sure that we, that we minimize the areas of abuse. But it's not only the areas of abuse related to cannabis. The problems caused by alcohol abuse and by many other forms of illicit uh, drugs as having devastating effects on our community. So as a society overall, we've got to find a way to respond more effectively through education and other means to ensure that it is, that the education is appropriate and, and making people aware of that. So we're not making a call on whether, whether we should or not. We're saying we must educate the whole society more effectively around it so we don't have the same uh, difficulties that we may, that people may have been referring to in the past. On the matter of hemp, the details of that will have to be engaged in the master plan, whether it contains 0 0.02 or 0 0.03, clearly just shows the ridiculousness of the policy when we have to import certain seeds for certain uh, THC levels of THC in, in, the, in the product. And that uh, must be examined, subjected to scientific rigor, and then we must take a decision on the society on how we want to move forward with that. But there are so many opportunities that are potentially vested in there that we have to move with speed to address that. Comrade uh, Richard Yankee uh, again makes the point about the speedy passage of the bill. We, we support that and we, in some respects, try to outline our view on the Constitutional Court and the obligation that that plays on, that that puts on Parliament. But out of the two measures or, or approaches that we've identified, we think the one that's most essential is the need for comprehensive policy that includes the issue about uh, decriminalizing personal use, but also looks at all of the other areas. And that's got to be the ambit of the discussion within the master plan. If as a society we agree there that certain elements due to regulatory or constitutional court or other obligations that we have need to be fast tracked, we can then take that decision there in consultation with the legislature. But I think our preference chair is clearly for a comprehensive policy that deals with all of the elements related to this. Comrade Wilma makes an important point, and we as concerned about the practices that are taking place at school. Again, here it's the question about making sure that we are able to expand the educational programs that we have, but also generally just engage learners more effectively, because whilst there is cannabis and, or other uh, medicines that young kids may take uh, to, to, to put them in some, in some adjusted state of mind, the, the same problems exist around alcohol and other things in school. So it's about the education, it's about the facilities, the safety, the value system of the society, when the use is appropriate or not. All of those issues has to be engaged upon and has, the society has to be educated. It's, it's partly born out of the horrendous states of prejudice that was meted onto cannabis and really pushing it to the outskirts of society that's caused some of the difficulties that we have, but clearly it should not be on the outskirts of society. I agree it has important medicinal and other values for, for its users, and it should be expanded as a medicine to confront many of the challenges in our society. But that's got to go along with education that undoes the prejudices of the past and hopefully positions people differently in how they respond to that. I can just say, Chair, that when we look at the international examples in countries like Portugal, and one or two sections of, of Britain, they've had great examples of how people, both from an alcohol perspective, as well as people who were on some of the other drugs like heroin, cocaine, and that, how they've been able to have a different approach to dealing with the drug usage and then the questions of addiction. Clearly, we must treat addictions, any kind of addiction, the same way we treat alcoholism. It's a disease. And we've got to be consistent in our approach to it. But it raises the question about, is it because big industries were behind parts of this section of the economy, whether it's alcohol or, or any of the other relaxants that are out there, and we've got to develop a new approach. For us, that's part of the comprehensive policy. Whilst we may not have outlined in detail what our views may be on the specific elements, 
And I'd want to ask the comrade Vilma that I'd be allowed to get back to you on the two specific clauses. But I want to try and stress to the committee that as the dynamic process I developed from when the constitutional court decision was taken, they started the process about drafting a bill to give effect to that. And then the bigger discussion about an approach towards cannabis in a master plan, those processes have both interacted with each other and have adjusted each other. And we've got to be mindful to respond to the pressures that are thrown up from that and, and nearly engage with, with some of the contradictions or challenges. In our view, they're certainly manageable. Our preferred uh, option, I'd like to state again, is for a comprehensive policy that deals with all of the elements that are, uh, that are potentially going to be engaged upon in the master plan. I hope I've done justice to the question, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Tony. Thank you for the response and thank you for the presentation. Um, I will now allow three minutes break uh, before we invite the Eastern Cape government. So can we start at 11? Agreed, thank you. Okay. Sure. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, Eastern Cape government. Uh, good morning, Honorable Jefferson. Good morning, Honorable members and uh, people who are in the meeting. I'm trying to share the presentation, Honorable Jefferson. I don't know whether it shows. It does, it does. Can you for a second switch switch on your, your camera so that we can see you? And then if your bandwidth is low, you can switch it off. hiding. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, my name is Mfundo Makubela, and I'm going to switch off the, I don't know whether I'm visible. I, I think I'm a little bit dark in the front. Yes, you're a little bit dark. But, but we saw you, you can proceed. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, I'm going to present the Eastern Cape Province Community Inputs 
to the cannabis bill for, for private purposes. Uh, these inputs were facilitated in November last year before the bill uh, inputs closed. We had the four sessions because we wanted uh, as many farmers or stakeholders as possible to participate or to have inputs on the bill. The first session was, of course, for the provincial executive, which was held on the 17th of November. The second uh, engagement was on the 19th of November, taking into a certain portion of the province. And then the third session was uh, on the 24th of November, taking another portion of the province. And then the fourth session was also on the 26th, was on the 26th of November. We ensured that almost all the province is covered and as many people as possible participated, but we ensured that um, it is held under the strict COVID regulations uh, protocols. The comments on the proposed cannabis bill for private purposes were as follows, as follows. The public consultations, the consulted public had the following comments on the bill. The bill was formulated without public participation. That was the first comment. The bill could have an impact on customary and indigenous law where economic uh, where economic and customary rights can be affected negatively as the bill currently stands. A law must be, must be developed that provide holistic legislation as opposed to the piecemeal approach that is currently proposed by the Department of Justice. This is in line with what uh, Honorable Pumule Yanji had been asking if we are, uh, this is what we are trying to say, the previous speakers. And even our, uh, the, even our um, uh, people in the SNK province who participated in the bill, they, they said exactly that, that instead of having the piecemeal approach, we rather have a, a legal framework that look into the holistic uh, cannabis approach, uh, approach. Then the other comment was, there was a lack of consultation with the traditional leadership under whose ambit most of the existing cannabis cultivation takes place. And lastly, um, the, it, takes, it lacks participation in regard to the protection and investment of human rights. So these are the things that, uh, or the comments that were made by people who participated in the bill. But if I can get a little bit deeper into them to unpack them, uh, they, they talked about criminalization rather than commercialization. So the uh, people first, uh, felt that the bill rather criminal, uh, is more on criminalizing the uh, production of cannabis and is quiet on commercializing the uh, production of cannabis. For example, they say criminal, criminalizing cannabis perpetuate the involvement of South African police services and the Department of Justice in attempting to regulate and control cannabis use in the country that costs government money, makes farmers criminals, and will make the policing more and more difficult as low THC, uh, CBD, and industrial cannabis start to become more prevalent which will require testing of THC levels. For example, if ever uh, the, farm, the policeman arrests you with a, a consignment of, a, of a cannabis, uh, and you say that this is hemp that you are loading, it has a THC which is below 2%, they have to test it first before they arrest you. And it makes a, it will work a lot for the uh, South African police because they have to test and determine whether the TAC level is less than 2%. And then if it's less than 2%, then they, they can release you. But if it's more than 2%, they can arrest you. Now, where are the labs that they're gonna use to test that? So these are the comments that came from the people. Alignment with social, with social welfare and drug policy. Uh, the, the, uh, the proposed bill is not aligned to South African drug master plan 20. 
2024, which states uh, uh, it goes all that statement. But the main statement here that people felt that the, this bill is not aligned to social welfare and drug policy. The cannabis for private purposes, as it stands, the proposed bill excludes any person who does not have access to private space to cultivate cannabis from access to cannabis. To, from access of the cannabis. So, yeah, so, and it's got CBD in it. Sorry. Mustaine? Mustaine? Mustaine, can you mute yourself? And proceed, sir. Another. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. The another input on that, uh, it was said that there is a considered view that this is an unconstitutional as it prevents a considerable portion of South African population who live in an informal settlement or high density areas from the ability to cultivate cannabis and therefore a legal means to obtain cannabis. Then the third aspect that was raised uh, here is that it fails to make provision for how people can access seed to cultivate cannabis. Uh, the quantities of cannabis for traditional and religious use, uh, communities or people felt that cannabis for private purpose bill serves to effectively criminalize traditional healing because the quantities that are stipulated, they don't allow uh, enough uh, cannabis for traditional healing. There was a suggestion that uh, quantities for cultivation and storage for personal use in the proposed bill are inadequate for traditional healers, and they use cannabis for professional purposes to assist their clients as directed by the Amakosi, their ancestors, and in the privacy of their homes. Groups that use cannabis for other reasons, including religious uh, reasons, cannot be covered by the quantities prescribed under the personal use. The quantities prescribed for ritual use should also be different from personal use and linked to observed uh, use during the rituals. So there were comments that uh, the quantities for ritual use and for traditional heal, uh, use and medicines, they cannot be the same as just for a uh, private use. Expungement. It was uh, indicated that all criminal records from the use, possess possession, and trade in cannabis must be expunged from the record with immediate effect. All prisoners being held on cannabis charges in South Africa jails must be released with no conditions, with immediate effect. So these are the things that were raised by the people. Cannabis and children, uh, it was felt that um, the bill is too strict because children, they are trained by the communities how to uh, manage the bill. I mean, the, how to manage the production of cannabis uh, skills and knowledge are transferred to the children there are rules and guidelines that are put in place and the, uh, children assist their parents on the production of, of uh, cannabis. And then now the proposed amendments and items for inclusion into the proposed bill. For example, the issue of the genetics. South Africa is a home to distinctive and well famous land races trains such as Pondo Gold and Transkei Gold. And uh, those are that those uh, genetic or emphasis to genetic, they must be included in the bill. These genetic are, are naturalized, drought tolerant, and should form part, should form, I mean, uh, should form the basis of our cannabis research and industry. These trains represent imported intellectual property and plant readers' rights that the cannabis bill should seek to protect as part of our cannabis heritage as a matter of agency. So that is what uh, uh, the uh, people said that rather than the bill is uh, trying to criminalize people, it has to ensure that the genetic material is protected and that there, there is an intellectual property rights 
that is uh, related to that. Development of the local markets. There can be no cannabis industry in South Africa without developing local markets. There is a potential, there is a potentially massive opportunity to create new pathways for rural development, placing a huge a viable cash crop in the hands of the rural poor, marginalized and dispossessed people. So these were the aspects that uh, people who attended these sessions came up, came out with as and into the bills. Uh, I mean, into the bill, and also as a proposed items that must be added into the bill. Some they said they would let us uh, remove this. Some they said let us add this. Otherwise, everybody who attended the sessions, they were happy with the bill. They said that the bill is good because the crop has to be regulated. Otherwise, it can be abused but it has to ensure that it commercialize. I mean, it takes into consideration commercialization of cannabis. It has to take into consideration that it doesn't oppress uh, the traditional healers. It has to take into consideration that it protects the genetic material that already exists in the province. It has to take into consideration that um, uh, it is in line with the uh, other bills that are in other departments. So thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. Um, I will now invite hands, uh, questions or comments. Honorable Mola, Honorable Nikos Drachan, in that order. Honorable Bianchi. Uh, well, well, thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, the presenter is making uh, an input on criminalization as compared to commercialization. In the master plan, the proposal there is that uh, there must be permits or licensing which must therefore prevent these cannabis to be used for illegal purposes. So do they think that uh, the licensing or the permits that must be issued for to those who want to trade on cannabis, do they think that those permits will give more restrictions for our people not to have a, 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 an enough space to trade with uh, these uh, cannabis or they, these permits are to actually give restrictions for illicit uh, trading and opening for new uh, opportunities or vast opportunities as it relates to this cannabis. The second issue chair that I want to raise is that uh, uh, they are mentioning an issue of prisoners that were, were imprisoned be before uh, for on purposes that they were illegally uh, trading on, um, on, on, on cannabis. Uh, in law there is what uh, is termed uh, retrospective application. We may finish uh, maybe around uh, December, uh, finishing up this bill or the process uh, until it is signed by the president. But the principle of retrospective application would actually have an adverse in, 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 in effect on the matters they are raising, which relates to those who were previously arrested for having illegally operated on this kind of piece. I just wanted to make that point. It's not a question, it's just a comment, just on the retrospective application of law. Uh, so at term, um, they, they, even our people understand how these things operate. Uh, but then we'll have time as the committee to, to have an engagement uh, 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 on, the, on, on the bill. I think uh, we, we have noted some of the things that you said, Chair, 
which will help us as the committee to arrive at a decision that uh, will, will best suit our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Ngola, Honorable Nico Trachem. Thank you uh, very much to the Eastern Cape for the presentation. I see in your written submission, mm -hmm. it says uh, phase two, uh, it says that it's difficult as it means to develop or the commercialization um, stage, but was restricted due to the lack of enabling legislation to drive this sector. The challenges we still face today, it is said there, now, I would like to ask with this written submission and then with the Cannabis for Private Purposes Bill, I would like to ask, you know, the people of the Eastern Cape, what do you want to see? Do you want a complete change of this uh, private use bill to include everything that they are recommending? especially for the commercialization purposes or for commercial purposes, or what do the people of the Eastern Cape want to see from this bill? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Nicole Trachans, Honorable Swart. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Well, I firstly don't think it's necessarily correct to ask the Eastern Cape government what the people of the Eastern Cape want, although we do appreciate the fact that they do possibly as elected representatives represent the people. And we appreciate the inputs that have been forwarded to us by the Eastern Cape government and the fact that they have held, um, at least held some discussions with representative groupings. But I do think we need to hear directly from the Eastern Cape people. So can I just ask, I'm interested, and I appreciate the fact that these submissions have been sent to us. But as far as the Eastern Cape government itself is concerned, as a government, I'd like to ask the input from the government itself, firstly about the tagging of the bill. Surely the Eastern Cape government would like to see this bill, as uh, on, uh, Mr. Prince pointed out, that this should be a 76 bill, given that it has an impact on the provinces and not as it is tagged as a 75 bill. I'd like that input from the, and we can get another input with your leave, um, Chairperson, it doesn't necessarily have to be oral, but I would like to hear the government's position of the Eastern Cape on this issue, on secondly, the issue of the permits and licenses and the possibility that are raised with the Department of Agriculture, the possibility that they admitted of corruption in the granting of licenses, what steps would the Eastern Cape government take to prevent the abuse of the granting of licenses or the granting of licenses to politically affiliated people as opposed to people on the ground? I think those are challenges. We know of the issues relating to corruption. And I think we would need to also engage if a government comes like the Eastern Cape government, we, we welcome the submission, but we the, the whole thrust of this submission is about the views of people. I think we need to engage on the provincial level of government itself as well and possible abuses that do take place there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chanche. Uh, thank you, Chair. Again, I'm going to stay consistent just uh, to ask the Eastern Cape government. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, it's very helpful that they, 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 they have uh, taken the trouble to interact with the communities there. As, uh, and, and, and that we appreciate, and I hope that it's something that uh, others would do. I do know, Mr. Swart, uh, think, agreeing with you on your concerns, that we were helped a great deal in the 3GBV. We also had a, 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 a community safety department in the Western Cape that came in front of us and presented uh, their views. So this is not a new uh, 
creation from the Eastern Cape. We have an experience in that regard, just as recent as we dealt with the three uh, GBV bills. Um, so the, the issue that I want to, to, to get to the Eastern Cape consistently is where do they stand on this? Do they, do they support that uh, we proceed with this bill in, in, in the manner that it is, or uh, are they raising a, a different uh, approach? I, I'm, I'm just being consistent on this chair so that I, I follow everybody else who comes here. I don't want people to present, and I don't know what they were actually saying after raising all of the important issues. Are they in support or they are, as the issues they are raising, are they advocating for this more holistic uh, approach? Well, they have raised issues of, of constitutionality and, 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 and all of that. So perhaps in summary, if he can, he can assist us in, in that regard, because if we were to do uh, further public hearings in the province, we would piggyback on the work they've done. So we would not reinvent that wheel. We would find a way to say with the Eastern Cape, you have done this, you've come to Lusikisig, if you've come to Lusikisig, we're, we're here to confirm what you've done. So it, it, it's not taking anything away from what we would do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And Mr. Rian Stradom, are you from the department? No, he's been raising his hand all the time. So he's Hi. Hi, guys. Oh, let me yes, just speak to the department. Um, I, I'm representing CDC SA, and also I'm just a business owner in cannabis. I will be at the Cannabis oh, Expo in sorry, sir. November. Sorry, Hi. sorry. Sorry. Uh, this process is is an interaction between people who are presenting, who have asked to present. Where, uh, oh, when we, hello, this yeah, I am. is um, this I commented on the cannabis bill when you just uh, let it out, when you just made it public for the public comments. No, 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 no. This is not acceptable because uh, we hear as uh, Eastern uh, uh, thing, uh, other thing, other 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 people want to present. Guy, can you please just move? Can can we please? Can you please move, guy, so that we can continue with the presentation? Mr. Stradom, we there are organizations that have asked to present, so it's only those organizations who have asked to present and were given permission. They are going to present and be asked questions by members of parliament. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, uh, Department of Eastern Cape. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, yes. I will start with a question from Honorable Nola. Yeah, prior time. About it about the attitude of the Eastern Cape uh, communities to the hemp permits and the cannabis licenses. Indeed, uh, the people of the Eastern Cape, they fully support the hemp permits. They see it exactly as the opportunity to ensure that the cannabis is properly regulated and the market is done correctly, uh, legally, not illegally. So they fully support the aspects of um, uh, regulating it through permits, but they only request that permits uh, must be easily accessible and they must be affordable as well. Actually, they, they propose that it, it, might, it might even be uh, cheaper or easier if they can be done uh, provincially than nation, uh, nationally, the hemp permits. Maybe the marijuana licenses, they, they can still be managed uh, nationally. They don't have a problem with marijuana licenses that are managed uh, by SAPRA nationally, but they feel that the hemp permits, they can be uh, done provincially. That is their proposal. If I come to, okay, uh, to the issue of the prisoners, the uh, prospection of a, a application, 
Uh, that one uh, we will uh, probably uh, tell them again that we are we were advised like this and some it might happen that some of them they know that process uh, unfortunately honorable chairperson myself uh, the, the legal aspects uh, I, i'm not very good on them or on it so uh, but um, we can always tell them about that process and uh, coming to honorable wilma uh, who was uh, asking uh, what do the people want to see in the bill? And uh, I think that question was probably answered by Honorable uh, Swat, uh, because uh, ourselves as government, we were facilitating that people must have an, an input to the bill before it closed. And this is exactly what we were presenting here. We presented what they said. And actually I tried to summarize it as much as possible. It was more than what I presented honorable members. Um, we submitted the written submission as, as for, for reference. And then coming to honorable Swart's question and what the government wants on the bill, the government feels that the bill is fine. It is it's right, it's correct especially in the light that there is a cannabis master plan that is developed uh, alongside the bill. So the bill is uh, taking into consideration the private use and uh, also other aspects of uh, utilization. But uh, the, the, the provincial government also feels that uh, the aspects of um, that that were raised by the people, for example, the aspect of uh, traditional use, maybe those aspects can be taken into consideration in the bill, and then uh, the use for uh, medicinal purposes in particular, uh, th that might that, that can be taken into consideration in the bill, and then also the the protection of the genetic material. So those are the minor things that it, I, I, they are minor, but they have a huge impact on the people who are who raised them. Otherwise, the Eastern Cape government feels that the bill is fine, is correct, and then it, uh, the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development must continue with it. Coming to Honorable Janji's question, um, as to uh, as a province government, do we support the bill? Yes, uh, honorable, we support the bill uh, fully as a government and uh, with all with those uh, changes that uh, uh, I just raised that they can be taken into consideration. Thank you very much, honorable chairperson. Thank and you very honorable much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the government of the Eastern Cape, especially for taking, making the effort to consult all corners of the Eastern Cape to get. Sorry, Chair. Cape. Sorry, Chair. Just SWAT, Chair. Yeah? Yes, Honorable SWAT. Just the one question that I put about dealing with possible corruption wasn't answered. Okay. Um, particularly if you. First? Can I finish first? Did I'm I... sorry, Chair. Thank you. No, especially for making an effort to ensure that all corners of the Eastern Cape, uh, at least there was an effort to ensure that people people's views uh, are coordinated and uh, are expressed uh, in this process. I think that should be encouraged, especially in the bills that directly affect our people. I think uh, because not everybody has got access to the resources that are needed to make your views heard. I think uh, it was a very progressive approach from the Eastern Cape government. Uh, Honorable Swart, your question that was not answered. No, it just related to concerns about licenses and the possibility of corruption and the possibility of the cost of licenses being too high, particularly given that the input also referred to the possibility of hemp industry being the permits being granted at a provincial level and what steps government will take, the Eastern Cape government, to prevent that occurring and what checks and balances would be in place. Thank you. Um, I think he, he will repeat it, but I think he, there was an attempt to answer that question, uh, but he can repeat it uh, uh, for Mr. For Honorable Swart's uh, attention. Can you repeat what you said about 
some of them being national and some of them being provincial. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, Honorable Chairperson, exactly that. Um, be, and then um, with the, the hemp permits, we felt that we can manage them provincially. And uh, of course, uh, we will man the issue of corruption on hemp permits. Uh, I've never had, even with the licenses, it's my first time to hear for, from the Honorable. Uh, maybe it's because that they are done nationally, so we don't have that information that uh, there is corruption between people who are applying and then because the issue of applying for the hemp permit and the DACA license is between the applicant and the people to whom you are applying. So we never been exposed to that information, but it was the province, uh, we will ensure that there is no corruption on issuing the hemp permits. And I'm sure that it, it will be very cheaper. They will be very cheaper for now. They are about 900 endurance. I think they will be even much cheaper. We have control measures. We issued them honorable members, I mean, honorable chairperson uh, in 1999. They were issued by the, pro by the province up to 2005. And then after that, when we finished the research trials, we stopped uh, issuing them and because we allowed for commercialization to be issued by SAPRA again. So uh, we are uh, doing a lot of things as, as, as government and uh, we are trying to ensure that there is no corruption as much as possible starting from the executive uh, of the province going down to uh, uh, individual departments and individual officials. There is a huge, um, a drive towards uh, uh, ensuring that there is no corruption. So uh, I'm, I can be confident, uh, Honorable Chairperson, that we, uh, the corruption won't be a problem in the, when it comes to issuing of the permits provincially. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And uh, corruption and corruption should be broader than just the politically exposed people. It should also be corruption in the private sector, especially monopolization by big industries. I think that should also be taken into consideration, Mr. Keep. Yes, Honorable Chairperson, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can we have uh, the Center for Child Law? Thank you, Honourable Chairperson and Honourable Members. Um, I'm Advocate Morgan Courtney. Um, I'll be presenting on behalf of the Centre for Child Law. A presentation was forwarded to the Secretary. I'm not sure whether he can put it up for us. I see. Yeah. Can you put, can you fly to the presentation? Committee Secretary, can you fly the presentation? Yes, Chair, uh, we're on it, sorry, Chair. Um, but, okay, just a sec. The presenter also has powers, Chair. You can fly it on your side. Uh, okay, uh, there is it. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The The Centre for Child Law's position, um, insofar as the bill is concerned, I think must primarily be derived from the uh, South African legal framework. And what we've done is, uh, in our submissions, we have drawn on the existing framework. The bill will not op operate in a particular vacuum, but would rather coincide and coexist with certain provisions that must be adhered to. Importantly is, is obviously the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. And there in, in my slide, I've, I've listed the, the rights of immediate relevance. But also and possibly more importantly is that the bill must also recognize that the Children's Act, the, um, as well as the Child Justice Act, as well as the uh, Prevention of and Treatment for Substance Abuse Act, all will play a role to play, particularly insofar as children are concerned. Now, those pieces of legislation have been interrogated quite recently. 
um, in the decision of S versus LM, which is on the, the next slide. Uh, but perhaps before I, I, I address what S versus LM was about, um, it's also important, and perhaps to Honourable uh, Member Nero Drakken's uh, question earlier, is that the South African Schools Act also, in fact, plays an important part um, in the regulation of children, particularly children who are found um, either using or in possession of cannabis. So moving to, to the decision of, of S versus LM, and perhaps I'm not sure if any of the members have read the judgment penned uh, by the Gauteng um, uh, Local Division of the High Court in Johannesburg. That particular judgment dealt with a variety of issues, but it, it originated um, from the conviction or the diversion of four, particularly four young children, four uh, school children, who all tested positive for, uh, for Dacha at, whilst at school. And how it came about that they entered into the criminal justice system was that the, the National Prosecuting Authority, as well as the school, had developed this program called the Drug Child Program, which would randomly test various children at school. Those children who tested positive were referred to the criminal justice system for processing um, and were often diverted. And the children who did not uh, complete their diversion successfully uh, those children were then brought back to court and ordered to undergo periods of compulsory residence. Now, the matter, a magistrate flagged a variety of issues um, in the treatment of these children who were accused of these offences, and it came before the High Court on urgent special review. Now, importantly, what the, the, the judgment does is it sets out how one should treat children generally in the criminal justice system. But importantly, for, for present purposes, is it sought to engage on the question of whether or not it should remain a criminal offence for, uh, for children to be found in use or possessing um, cannabis in terms of the Drugs Trafficking Act. The case did not centre on legalisation, which is effectively what the Prince judgment um, by a constitutional court dealt with, but rather decriminalisation. In other words, is criminal prosecution for drug-related uh, offences, and particularly cannabis-related offences, and so far as children are concerned, whether or not that is constitutionally defendable. Now, the court went and, in its judgment, unpacked all the various submissions. But the one thing that, that, that stood out was that the, the government respondents, which were all the, the Department of Justice, the South African Police Service, the Department of Social Development, the Department of Basic Education, um, they all agreed, uh, and correctly so, that criminalization in respect of children most certainly violates their rights. And importantly, the concession is made that, it is, that criminalization is not the answer to trying to deal with um, children who may suffer from some or other drug dependency. And I think that echoes the position adopted by Kosatu, which I think is uh, also correctly made. And that it is important to emphasize that the Center for Child Law's primary position is that when we're dealing with cannabis insofar as children are concerned, and whilst we accept that there may very well be a need to protect them from cannabis use or cannabis abuse, that criminalization most certainly is not the answer. And what S versus LM does, is it sets the groundwork for, for the discussion and should inform any policy uh, and legislative reform going forward. S versus LM, because it declared sections of the Drugs Trafficking Act unconstitutional, is currently awaiting confirmation proceedings in the Constitutional Court and a date has unfortunately uh, not yet um, been provided. But I do think that, that it, it would be important that Parliament take heed of the fact that the Constitutional Court is going to be dealing with this particular matter, uh, and hopefully will deal with it um, in time for, for whatever its, its views are can uh, be appropriately addressed in the bill. Um, the Centre, obviously, uh, when having a look at the, the bill itself, and in light of particularly the judgment that came from um, the Gauteng Local Division, uh, sought to, 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 well, attempted to uh, 
craft its recommendations so that the, the recommendations themselves accord broadly with our understanding of, of what the judgment means and what we believe the Constitutional Court is likely to find um, vis-a-vis children and cannabis-related offences. So turning then to the submissions of the centre, our primary concern with the bill in its present form is that it fails to meaningfully address children who may find themselves in, a, in the cycle of drug abuse uh, and who may very well find uh, be found to have contravened um, the provisions of the Act. And we must stress again that the bill must take into consideration the other legislative obligations of the state and the rights and responsibilities uh, set out in, in the legislation that I mentioned at the outset. The bill in its present form we submit, um, and at least insofar as children are concerned, does not adequately do so. So whilst the centre in broad brushstrokes most certainly supports um, the, the bill um, and what the bill attempts to do, there are various uh, problems that, that I will uh, seek to address. The first problem, which is on the, the next slide that, that the centre identifies in its submissions, is the, term, uh, is the use of the, the term guardian. Now, the bill defines a guardian in, in terms of what, how it is defined in the Children's Act. Now, the problem with that is that the term itself does not actually reflect the lived realities of most of uh, most children in South Africa. Most children in South Africa do not live or are not in the permanent care of, of his or her guardians, but rather in the care of extended families, grandparents, grandmothers in particular. Um, and we would suggest that to the extent that, that guardianship is, is a relevant criteria, that a, the term appropriate person rather be used and the term appropriate person is uh, in the process of being included in the Child Justice Act and would then obviously refer to any member of a child's family, including his or her sibling, uh, who is 16 years or older, as well as uh, any form of caregiver. So we, su we submit that the term is far more inclusive and encompassing of, of the, the family structures that exist in South Africa, uh, rather than, than the term guardian. The bill also provides then at clause three, um, and insofar as it contains a range of offenses, but clause three provides what are known as cultivation uh, related offenses. And the problems that we identify in our submission is effectively that firstly, clause 3.2 of the bill seems to create somewhat of an anomalous situation. If one works, if one has regard to the bill itself, 3.2 provides that any person who cultivates a cannabis plant at any person, at any place, and who fails to take reasonable measures to ensure that the cannabis plant is inaccessible to a child is guilty of a class C offense. Now, the anomalous situation is caused by the fact that, or the unintended consequence of that is that it would, it would effectively also include children who may very well um, uh, be, be growing cannabis in, in their uh, backyards um, from taking reasonable steps, for instance, from preventing um, their siblings from gaining, gaining access to it. And what we submit is that the, the, that particular issue ought to be, be considered and the practical consequences of that particular offense should be better thought through. The prohibition also runs contrary to the exceptions created in the bill, vis-a-vis uh, -vis children who are, in, who are allowed to assist in the cultivation of cannabis um, plants that are grown by their guardians. And there, particularly the clause 6.1b of the bill, specific provision is made um, for th that effectively allows children to assist in the day-to-day uh, operations of their guardians, uh, cannabis uh, business or, or personal growth. Um, what we submit and, and what we, we set out in, the, in our submissions is that we That's believe that the, the uh, confusion uh, may be cured by either removing the defense 
vis-a-vis -vis guardians, or by qualifying this particular clause uh, that deals with um, the, the exception in clause 6.1b. We also note in relation to cultivation offenses that the offense applies to anyone and everyone, and there is no special provision made in respect of children. Once again, children may very well find themselves uh, accused of cultivating uh, or accused of one of the cultivation offenses. And we believe that particular emphasis should then be placed on ensuring that the children themselves um, are protected and afforded the maximum uh, protections in terms of the Child Justice Act. And if adults are using children in those particular instances, that particularly section 92 of the Child Justice Act be referenced. And we make a submission, uh, we, we provide the, the committee in our submissions with a template um, of what we believe um, the, the clause should look like. Then moving on to the cannabis related offenses. The cannabis related offenses, much like the uh, cultivation offenses, also applies to, to any person and not just adult persons, despite the, the wording of the bill. Now, the center doesn't have any objections per se, but, but submits that it would be appropriate and necessary once again, um, and as was the case in cultivation offenses, to make reference to the Child Justice Act as well, uh, and particularly section 92 of the Child Justice Act is concerned, as well as making special provisions uh, for children um, accused of uh, cannabis related um, offenses, particularly those uh, that contained in, in uh, section seven, uh, which deals with obviously any person who is in possession in a public space of cannabis that is not concealed from public view is guilty of a class C um, offense. Then in relation uh, to the consumption related offenses, once again, these provisions are aimed at, at anyone and everyone um, and in, are inclusive of children. Now, what the center recommends, um, and, and it applies generally to, to all the offenses relating to uh, children in particular, is that rather than being prosecuted, the bull should look at um, alternative avenues to ensure that children receive the necessary assistance, particularly those where they are found in, in, in possession of small quantities, um, that are evidently uh, for personal use or are found consuming um, cannabis. So whilst the center does not support children making use of cannabis um, or possessing cannabis, what, we, uh, what our overall contention is, is that the criminal justice system is most certainly the incorrect forum for these matters to be dealt with. And S versus LM, which I mentioned at the outset, clearly provides um, that or, or clearly confirms that criminalization is certainly not the answer, particularly uh, insofar as children are concerned. Where a child is found uh, um, using cannabis um, or is in possession of cannabis, then there are various protective measures that are contained in the Children's Act, particularly Section 150. So we often hear of parents who uh, complain that, that their children are um, addicted to some or other drug um, and are in need of assistance and often turn to the criminal justice system in an attempt and perhaps a misguided attempt to assist them um, cure their, their children of this illness. The Children's Act makes provision explicitly for drug use and dependency in children and parents being themselves unable to, to assist their children. So the, the bill itself, insofar as it deals with children, or to, to properly consider what the Children's Act says. Um, in addition to that, there is obviously the, the provisions of the Prevention of and Treatment for Substance Abuse Act, which also provide for the referral of children to treatment centers in the event that they are addicted to some or other drug, depend, uh, uh, some or other drug and in this particular circumstance, uh, to the extent that they, they are said to be um, addicted to cannabis that those particular provisions um, ought to be applied. These particular outliers, um, and if we go to, to the next slide, these particular, out, uh, these particular protections are well able to be slotted in um, when dealing with the protective measures that are contained in... 
Yes, you have, sorry. You have five minutes. Thank, thank you, Honourable Chairperson. I, I am almost done. Um, we submit that, that these uh, protective measures could be included in Clause 6. Um, clause 6 itself has certain shortcomings, which we highlight um, in our, our submissions themselves. But what we submit is that, that the committee should give uh, proper consideration to whether or not it truly intends to criminalize children when there are other better um, measures in place and measures that the government itself has accepted are better alternatives to criminalization, particularly in relation to, to the kind of what could be called petty offenses. Um, those, those then would be the, the uh, submissions of the center. And as said at, at the outset, whilst the center broadly um, supports the bill, the bill in its current format is, is not workable, um, at least in so far as children are concerned and more thought must be given as to how we are going to be protecting our youth uh, in the future. Thank you very much, Advocate Gornish. Thank you for the presentation. And members, uh, any comments or questions? Honorable uh, Swart. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you for the submission. I think it's very helpful um, to have that emphasis and particularly the LM case. And I recall, uh, Chairperson, when we tried to deal with um, sexual promiscuity in adolescence through the criminal law, and that was in the Criminal Law Sexual Offences Amendment Act, and that was uh, possibly not the correct approach, and it was struck down by the Constitutional Court following the teddy bear decision. And I think one can learn a lot from this submission as well as what occurred in that matter that when we are dealing with the possibility of substance abuse or the impact on adolescence of cannabis, that it should we should move towards what the presenter, the advocate is saying, rather not approach it from a criminal justice perspective, but from a social perspective and look at other methods of dealing with this, this issue. I would like to just ask the advocate, when we, we were, the, the issue of the LM case, which I have read, and it's, I seem to remember that the fact that the High Court struck down all criminalization would also mean that restorative justice provisions would not be applicable. Um, what is your views on that? And I suppose it, it speaks for itself because criminalization would involve a restorative justice approach, which then wouldn't be applicable. But surely you would support some method of a restorative justice approach um, to deal or to assist adolescents, children, and families that are concerned with the possible substance abuse by their children and then try to make use of the criminal justice sector rather than social welfare interventions. And I'm sure Ms. Niva Druchen would agree with me that that could be a, an approach given her social welfare background and experience in communities. So we try to find what is in the best interests of the children. So I, I welcome your submissions and your particularly um, your, your proposed suggestions to improve the bill in this regard. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Swart. Advocate Courtney. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Swart, for, for the question. Um, insofar as the, the question uh, relating to restorative justice is concerned, um, one, one must, and, and what LM clearly um, tries to, to differentiate is the fact that a justice response to substance abuse, and, and let me call it substance abuse proper, those children who are uh, in the grips of some form of substance abuse, that, that a criminal justice response can never be appropriate. So the restorative justice element um, that you're advocating or, or that you, you make mention of would not, would not find application in those instances. Where restorative justice may very well prove to be uh, useful is where children are... Um, uh, found uh, or, or are convicted or at least charged 
with some of the more serious offenses um, that, that are outlined in the bill. And you would have noted from our submissions that what we're not saying is, is simply uh, do, do nothing with them, but rather the more serious offenses um, that uh, dealing, um, drug dealing and, and the like, that those uh, type of offenses could be dealt with um, by a, a, a more restorative justice response. Whereas where a child is found in, in possession of small quantities um, of, of cannabis that were evidently made, uh, evidently for um, his or her individual use, that in those, uh, and maybe in the grips of some other uh, addiction, that a social response to that particular problem is the most appropriate um, response. What we can't do is the criminal justice, um, to use the old analogy, is is like taking a sledgehammer to a nut. Uh, it just doesn't work. And what the, the story of these four particular children in LM demonstrate is despite, and I, I happily accept that the NPA was, was trying to act in the best interest of these children, but despite their, their, um, their altruism in that regard, these children were, were effectively incarcerated for a, for, for a period of eight or nine months before eventually being released for an offense, an incredibly petty offense. Um, and that child, uh, as a child, you live in a continuum. You only have so many years as a child and so many years to develop. Uh, and that is all but ruined by having to spend nine months um, in a facility designed effectively to keep um, children who have committed very heinous offenses um, off our streets. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Courtney. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you are released. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you for the for making such a presentation. Um, the next presenter, which will be the last presenter for the day, is uh, Shandos Artemis. Thank you, Honorable Chair, if I may proceed. Yes, you can proceed. Um, greetings, Honorable Chair and members of this por uh, Parliamentary Portfolio Committee. Thank you for the opportunity. It's, uh, it's been a long road and I must confess that it's an honor to be able to sit and present to you all today. My name is Paul Michael Keichel. My colleague, Andrew Laurie and I will be speaking on behalf of Schindler's attorneys. He'll be handling a different aspect to me. Um, Schindler's Attorneys has supported the legalization efforts um, in respect of cannabis since at least 2013 and almost entirely pro bono. What I purport to do in this presentation is to address some general jurisprudential observations. Um, while Mr. Laurie will address you as to how and why we say that meaningful and effective reform of our cannabis laws is not too big a fish to deliciously fry, ultimately. Um, Having said that, Chair, the Parliamentary Committee has our written submissions. They run into 25 pages with little to no repetition. So what I propose to do today is not to waste everybody's time by rehashing those. Also, I'll try not to overlap with what other speakers have said or what I anticipate they are likely to say, not only, well, in, in the coming days. Um, and of course, we will avail ourselves to answer any questions from the committee, and I would rather leave more time for questions than to burden you with what's already in writing. Honourable committee, I talk to you today as a lawyer. I come dressed, in fact, as a lawyer. <laughs> but fundamentally, despite talking the language of a lawyer, I'm a human being. I'm a human being who is subject to your lawmaking and the application of your laws. Um, I address parl this parliamentary committee with due deference and with due respect, but I will be appealing to you as empathetic human beings, as the following presentation hopefully makes clear. My ultimate submission is that the problem with the Cannabis for Private Purposes Bill is that it is premised on a system of criminal prohibition. And I say that a system of criminal prohibition is one which is illegitimate when it comes to drug use and possession and even drug trade for the following reasons. Your very own national drug master plan acknowledges that the war on drugs has failed entirely 
And that problem, and please underscore problem drug use, is a public health and not a criminal justice concern. We need to be empathetic human beings. We need to help and not harm our brothers and sisters in society. Now, while I talk to you as a human being, I am also a lawyer, and you are also all parliamentarians who have an oath um, to uphold the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. And so I'm going to keyhole what follows through Section 36 of our Constitution. And we're all familiar with Section 36 of the Constitution. It generally applies to when somebody sues government to say that a law or its application is being applied unreasonably, unjustifiably, and ultimately in infringement of that individual's human rights. So Section 36 is the prism through which we um, view all allegations of rights violation. I also ask you to please bear in mind the founding provisions of our Constitution. Section 36 of the Constitution talks about reasonable and rational legislate, uh, sorry, Section 36 of the Constitution in relation to reasonable and rational regulation of cannabis, which involves abandoning pr uh, criminal prohibition, is the very less restrictive means to achieve the purpose, and I quote that, which is referred to in Section 36. How we might go about reasonably and rationally, uh, rationally regulating cannabis in this country will be addressed by my colleague, Mr. Andrew Laurie, following upon me. But now there's this concept of general ration rationality, which underscores all constitutional jurisprudence. When there is available a less restrictive but more effective option, as in this case, the state will stand accused of irrational lawmaking and irrational application of harsh laws when it nonetheless prefers the more restrictive but less effective option. I will make the submission, and I do make the submission, that it is literally an assault on the citizens of our country. I say this because you have, with respect, entirely failed to account for the unthinkable and unjustifiable harms which befall an individual when they are dragged through our criminal justice system. These harms outweigh even the worst harms of cannabis use, which incidentally were overstated by the Department of Health last week. The Department of Health had the opportunity in front of the courts to put the evidence of cannabis harms before those courts and to prove them. I think it was in the words of the Constitutional Court that the Department of Health failed miserably in putting that evidence before court. So let us now not try to claw back on prohibition on the basis of science that, or on the basis of propaganda that has been overtaken by science. When we are looking at a balancing of harms, and we do not take account of the harms of criminal prohibition and of being dragged to court and being taken out of school and facing disciplinary inquiries and facing charges and spending time in holding cells, it results in a system where in an otherwise legitimate endeavor to prevent harm, the state inadvertently causes more harm than it could ever purport to prevent. And I must add at this stage that this philosophical and fundamentally human realization applies to all so-called drugs that fall below the established harms of tobacco and alcohol. Why is it that we must keep suing government for incremental change, substance by substance, entheogen by entheogen? And I must mention at this juncture that about two years ago in a Mail and Guardian event at which I spoke alongside SAPRA's then Griffith Molewa. I was asked the question, jokingly of course, by Mr. Molewa, why is it that civil society keeps suing government for change? Why is it that you don't just talk to us? And of course, the tongue-in-cheek answer from me was that we try, we write letters to government, we try to have productive engagements but generally speaking, the only time that we get government's attention is when we are standing talking on the steps of court. And that is an unfortunate situation. So instead of constantly suing government, drug by drug, entheogen by, entheogen by entheogen, substance by substance, why do we not appoint a task team or a commission of inquiry that entirely reforms our drug laws? On the basis of that science and statistics were long ago overtaken or oh, sorry, long ago overtook the 1970s political propaganda that came out of the United States and which actually informs our drug laws. 
not science, not statistics, not reason, not, rational, not rationality, propaganda. This much is common cause. This much has been proven. The data exists. If you just ask it of us, it shall be forthcoming. We are here to talk to government. Ultimately, what I'm going to say, therefore, given what everybody has said previously and is going to say in the following sessions, is that this goes beyond the cannabis master plan, which incidentally doesn't align with the cannabis for private purposes bill. It goes for that matter beyond an all encompassing cannabis act. We should revise the drugs and drugs trafficking act in total. It is outdated. It is unscientific. It is irrational. And insofar as it relates to the medicines and related substances act, the same thing can be said. Ultimately, before I hand over to my colleague, Andrew Laurie, who will take you through what rational and reasonable and non-invasive or, 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 not, uh, or quite easy legislation could look like, what I envisage, and I would like our lawmakers to keep this in mind, is would it not be an incredible day for our country if the preamble to what, it, what is ultimately the Cannabis for All Purposes Act, or whatever you might choose to call it, could read something like, to regulate the many uses of cannabis, mindful always to not do more harm to our fellow human beings, our brothers and our sisters, than what we prevent. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask Andrew Laurie to please come onto the screen and take over from me. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you Paul Michael. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, may proceed. Thank you. Um, honorable lawmaker, lawmakers of this portfolio committee, I, I do not intend to address you on the minutiae of the bill itself. That, that is not my place. Um, I'm also sensitive to the reality that the Constitutional Court judgment of September 2018 only requires you to go so far. However, while the iron is hot, I rather intend, you, I rather intend to address you on the spirit of the bill itself and the massive opportunity that it presents. Honorable lawmakers, the bill in its current form is primarily concerned with punishing people. The bill seeks to impose a complex set of limitations on the amount of cannabis and cannabis derivatives that can be possessed, cultivated, and shared in our private lives on pain of heavy criminal sanctions. For example, it is proposed that an adult person who grows more than four cannabis plants should be imprisoned for four years or fined. And, or that an adult who freely shares without remuneration four plants or more with another adult should be imprisoned for 15 years or fined. Honorable lawmakers, the reality is that South Africa is a great place to grow cannabis and that massive swaths of, the, of South Africa's most disenfranchised and vulnerable citizens already grow and share quantities greatly in excess of what is proposed. It is also called weed for a reason and nature is an unpredictable beast. Unforeseen and uncontrollable shifts in weather patterns can alter the amount of THC and CBD present in a plant or cause a plant to yield far more than expected. I mean, disposing of a few seeds on the ground in a remote part of one's land and leaving it unattended for a few months could lead to one arriving home to an entire field of cannabis. Lastly, the uses ascribed to cannabis plants are all but immeasurable in number. And all of these uses require different quantities of cannabis with the most desirable uses in the way of concentrated medicinal home remedies requiring the most cannabis and quantities well in excess of what the bill is pr proposing. The point of my submissions in this regard, honorable lawmakers, is that in the battle against South Africa's established growing community, community against the remarkable versatility of the cannabis plants and against nature itself, there will never be a rational and defendable limitation on the number of plants that can be cultivated and possessed. And there will never be a limitation which justifies dis the disproportionate harms wrought by the criminal justice system. There are too many variables. With respect, and to quote Myrtle Clark of Fields of Green for All, nobody counts our whiskey, and rightfully so. How much of the South African police services time and resources mm -hmm. Does the state intend to divert towards counting, weighing, and testing cannabis plants? How long is our already overburdened police service expected to spend chasing after hundreds of thousands of farmers and stoners? How much time and resources is our already overburdened judicial system expected to expend on ventilating rational defenses by these hundreds of thousands of farmers and stoners? And how long 
are we expected to bring constitutional challenges to the rationality of these limitations, which we assure you will continue. However, we submit that if the bill were to embrace and serve South Africa's established growing community, the remarkable versatility of the cannabis plant and nature itself, instead of seeking to limit against, against it, the bill represents a massive opportunity not to punish and to control, but rather to empower on an unprecedented scale. More specifically, if the bill were to abandon its attempt to narrowly impose limitations on the form and quantities of the plant itself, and rather focus on broadly enabling and regulating the uses of the plant, we achieve something great. If I may, honorable lawmakers, an analogy that I often refer back to in this regard is that in my garden, I can grow as much hops and barley as I like. I'm also at liberty to combine those hops and barley with yeast and water and brew as much beer as I like. However, the minute I want to sell my beer, the law requires me to first confirm the safety, quality, and efficacy of my product by obtaining a license to sell. The suggestion being that instead of regulating amounts and quantities and equivalencies, the bill should focus primarily on standards and thresholds in relation to the quality, safety, and efficacy of cannabis with a view towards reaching a point where the legislature is comfortable enough to allow at the very least our massive rural cannabis community to trade in cannabis for remuneration without the need for overly prescriptive barriers to entry. Fortunately, we submit that this approach is far simpler from both a drafting and enforcement perspective than the amounts, uh, the amounts and quantities based approach. At present, cannabis in South Africa exists on a spectrum. On the one end, there is the default position imposed by the constitutional court judgment, which is that South African adults can grow and consume cannabis in their gardens without, without adhering to any standards whatsoever. On the other end of the spectrum, there are medical standards, which are well documented. Now, if we also account for the fact that cannabis, unlike alcohol and tobacco, does not kill people, the bill, the bill would not need to go into any great depth in prescribing a baseline set of growing, reporting, and inspection standards, which at least elevates the safety, quality, and efficacy of cannabis grown and sold by rural farmers above the default position on the lowest end of the spectrum, which is that we don't need standards to grow and smoke it. Um, if, 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 standard, if a baseline can achieve a point where we are comfortable to allow rural trade, then we've already seen great success. Then if we work backwards and, and draw from the medical standards on the furthest end of the spectrum, it would also be possible to achieve a slightly more stringent baseline set of growing reporting and inspection standards, which could conceivably provide for non-rural commercial trade. This being a secondary objective, of course, to enabling rural trade. The suggestion is that by borrowing backwards from medical standards on the far end of the spectrum and accounting for the fact that unlike its more freely traded neighbors, alcohol and tobacco, cannabis does not kill people, the standards imposed by the bill can and should become less and less stringent as one moves further from medical standards through commercial standards and all the way to rural standards being on the lowest end of the spectrum. The highest court in the land have ruled- we have five minutes. Uh, I'm nearly done, thank you very much. Um, um, the highest court in the land has ruled that we may all grow and smoke cannabis without adhering to any standards at all. This means that there is scope for the legal principle of Valenti non-fit in urea to apply. Valenti non-fit in urea translates to a willing person, uh, sorry, to a willing person, it is not a wrong, or more formally, to voluntary assumption of risk. Using this paradigm, the exercise of using a standards-based approach to draft the bill would essentially amount to a relaxation of our already well-entrenched and well-documented medical standards, instead of having to conceive of new um, provisions afresh. We would essentially be reverse engineering something that already exists, um, accounting for the fact that by default, there are no standards that are required for me to grow and smoke my own cannabis. If we can use standards which already exist, reverse engineering, uh, reverse engineering them to get to a point that elevates the baseline to something higher than the default, then surely we can work together to achieve a point where we are comfortable with allowing rural trade to commence, and then above that, commercial trade, and then above that, medicinal trade. Growers aside, a uh, focus on a standards-based approach would also have the corollary effect of protecting the end user. At present, 
there are no such regulations. The end user can grow and smoke what they like without any adherence to standards whatsoever. Um, thank you for your time, honorable lawmakers. Uh, that, that is my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lorry. Uh, members, any questions or comments? Well, thanks, Chair. Uh, and thank you to the uh, presentation. Uh, Chair, I think uh, I, I like the fact that they've drawn interest uh, in coming to the public care consultations to help us as Parliament of the People to enact suitable laws that best represent our people. I've, I've got only one question. Uh, and this question, Chair, is on the basis that they are representing a law firm. Earlier on today, we had uh, the, the Eastern Cape uh, uh, Provincial Government and they have presented to the committee that uh, they've done uh, public consultations as the provincial government, interacting with our own people. Uh, the suggestion they received from those people that uh, were part of their public consultations uh, were that uh, we must, uh, as we enact uh, this uh, act, ensure that there is a retrospective application uh, in a manner that uh, will release those who were previously arrested, uh, having, been, having been caught uh, using in, uh, on, on illegal basis these cannabis. What is your view on this matter? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Mora. Over to you, Mr. Lori and Mr. Kitcher. Um, yeah, if I, if, if I could answer that in, in, in two phases, um, thank you. Um, indeed, this is, this is a multifaceted consultation process. Of course, we haven't done any sort of respectable data gathering in the sense of um, statistical data gathering and analysis. So we can't come to you and say that what we say necessarily represents the will of the people and uh, we, we, we are the people to listen to because i think that it's going to be a process of listening to everybody who makes submissions to you that um highlights what is actually the will of the people and and, and that will be the commonalities through the submissions because it seems that the differences between the submissions are few and far between so quietly. but as to the retrospective application of the act the fact of um, doing uh, or, or expunging criminal records for, for cannabis possession. And if I may say so, it's, it's, um, it ties in intricately with the notion of restorative ju justice because presently SAPRA debates decide whether or not they should be regulating everything cannabis. Um, they've put in place a, a, a whole set of guidelines, which um, one of which is that you're not going to get a cannabis license from SAPRA, a medicinal cannabis license in terms of the Medicines Act, if anybody um, at a high level on your team um, has a criminal record. Now, of course, if you have a criminal record for having grown or consumed cannabis in the prior 10 years, um, it means that ironically, you cannot get a job growing cannabis, despite the fact that you might be very, very good at that. Um, so the retrospective application of something like expunging criminal records is something which I think we fully endorse. It does represent the will of the people, and it's, it, it's something that I don't think you're going to find much opposition to from anybody who has made submissions or will yet make submissions. Um, and, and just to add to that, so something to guard against when it comes to retrospectivity is to make sure that once people are, are pardoned and they come out of jail, they're not faced with a bill which proposes that their jail sentences be doubled or tripled for the same reasons that they ended up there in the first place. Right now, if, if I was to, as I say, freely, without remuneration, give someone four or more cannabis plants in terms of the current bill, I'm in for 15 years. 
I would rather just stay in jail if that's what I was being faced with. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any further questions, members? None. Thank you very much, especially to the presenters and to everybody who has been listening and those who have joined uh, these public hearings. We are continuing with the public hearings tomorrow, starting same time, nine o'clock until uh, seven o'clock in the evening uh, to listen to everybody to try to ensure that the voices of the people are listened to uh, as we try to process this very complicated uh, bill. Uh, we are going to do our best to ensure that we listen to everybody. So um, for today, the meeting is adjourned. Let's meet tomorrow. For members of parliament, quarter to nine, the first presenter will start at nine o'clock. Thank you, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.